Don't be afraid to ask. There's no stupid questions when it comes to the health of your child, your pet. What are the indications for hyperbarics for an animal? How many sessions typically an animal would need after a surgery? What if I have a really big dog or like well, I have a small dog, would she get oxygen toxicity? Do you think they feel comfortable inside the chamber? You can't deny the effectiveness of it because you can literally see it. 1.3, probably not enough to treat an illness in an animal, right? What about cancer? It's a real thing and it has real capabilities and some things it cannot do. Welcome to Hyperbaric Living Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Masha. Today I have with me Dr. Diane Levitin. She's a veterinary doctor and a professor at Long Island University. She's really famous in the world of hyperbarics and veterinary medicine. She introduced many new concepts into the field. She's a publisher. She's teaching courses on hyperbaric medicine in veterinary uh, field. And she's helping other businesses. I am really excited to have her with me today. Welcome to the show, Diane. I'm so happy to be here. Yay, thank you for coming. And it's a special show because it's going to be on veterinary medicine. I've received a lot of requests from people who have hyperbaric chambers and they have pets and they don't know how to use hyperbaric chambers with their pets, whether it's good for them, what are the benefits. Some are a little scared. Some are just, you know, taking their pet in, but they don't know what to expect. So I am so happy I have you here with me. Mm -hmm. I can ask you all these questions. Let's start from the beginning. What are the indications for hyperbarics for an animal? So we use it for a lot of different reasons. Um, primarily it's used post-operatively for surgical procedures or we use high pressure. So we also have lower pressure chambers, but the typical treatment chamber would be a, at least a 1.6 to 2, 2 or 2.4 ATA. And so we'll treat things like pancreatitis, which is an excellent disease because it's such an inflammatory process. And we know that hyperbaric oxygen reduces inflammation so beautifully. We use it for spinal cord disease where the spinal cord is inflamed and very edematous, filled with fluid. And once we can reduce that swelling in the spinal cord, the dogs are able to function again, sometimes without surgery. So that's pretty amazing. Um, like I said, post-operatively after orthopedic procedures, you know, a lot of the pain that's caused is caused by swelling. So if we can reduce the swelling, we can improve healing and we can decrease pain. So those are just some of the awesome reasons why we'll use it. What about arthritis? Many dogs suffer from arthritis. So I've had some dogs that we use it for arthritis, but as we all know, hyperbarics doesn't last forever. So if we did it as a regular treatment, perhaps a weekly treatment, we could really help reduce the inflammatory part of arthritis and help improve stem cell production and perhaps create new blood vessels and improve the joint and maybe create some healing. But it would be something that would need to be going ongoing probably. So they would need to come every week at least, right? Yeah, I think so. To get some relief. Whereas if we use it post-operation, it's just a short-term treatment. How many sessions typically an animal would need? need after a surgery? So that's a good question. So sometimes we'll even do it preoperatively to, to get them ready for surgery because we know it also enhances healing if we give it before because it will increase the number of blood vessels and all kinds of wonderful protective mechanisms. But after surgery, we would probably do one or two treatments a day, probably for two to three days just to decrease that inflammation and promote healing. So it's not that many treatments actually. No. Not when it's an acute problem, the, the beauty of it is that if it happens quickly and we catch it quickly, we can reverse the damage quickly. It, sometimes it, it takes longer depending on what's going on, but it can be only a few days sometimes for more acute problems. Would you use it for uh, an infection uh, that started as a complication to surgery? Absolutely. So one of the, that is one of the most wonderful reasons, just like in human medicine, it definitely helps with lots of different infections because it also enhances the antibiotic activity. So you would want to use it probably with antibiotics, but it absolutely will help kill bacteria and kill fungal spores and really en enhance healing. And we do that for a lot of infections that are resistant to antibiotics like MRSA infections 
infections or infections in difficult to heal places like the urinary bladder, we can really cause the bacteria and the biofilms to, to die and we can treat those uh, infections very effectively. Is that a good biofilm destroyer? So to say, like, can it destroy biofilms? Or, I think or... it can absolutely help with the destruction of biofilm, probably not alone, but certainly um, in conjunction with other therapies, yes. So like proteolytic enzymes or what would you use together um, for, bi I'm just curious. It's okay. We would probably use mostly just antibiotic therapy. Sometimes we'll use a very alkaline triz substance along with, with hyperbarics, a rinse or a flush to get rid of the biofilm. And maybe even we'll find in the future that we can use um, hypochlorous acid, like the, the substance that's in our own neutrophils that helps break up biofilms. Talking about infections, I know you're working on a project with uh, Spain uh, on yes. leishmaniasis, on, yes. on the infection. Can you tell us uh, a bit about that? Because it's a big problem in Spain. Yeah, actually. so it's not going to be a hyperbaric oxygen treatment, although it would probably help tremendously. We haven't had the opportunity to treat these dogs with hyperbarics, but we did find a community of dogs that was in an endemic area that was known to be an endemic area in China. And a lot of those dogs have been adopted out across the world, um, many of them in the United States, but some in other parts of the world. And so we've, we're trying to work on treating them. We're trying to create new treatment protocols because we have such a large number that now we're screening them and hoping to treat it um, and find some new information about better treatments for leishmania. I'm curious to see if hyperbarics could be a good addition to that as well. Let us know. I'm sure it would. I, I hope that I would have that opportunity, but fortunately the medication does seem to really help decrease the symptoms. And so that's really good news there. The, yeah, absolutely. Because not everybody has an access to a, a hyperbaric chamber. Yeah. You've mentioned that um, the pressures that normally are used are 1.6 to 2.4. These are generally, these pressures are generally somewhat higher than what we tend to use with human beings. Because with humans, we start a little lower, especially for neurological diseases. And, and then we go higher. Of course, we go to 2.4 and even higher. But I, I see it a little bit skewed on the higher side. How would you explain that? So we actually don't have great data in veterinary medicine. So we extrapolate from human medicine. So that's why with neurologic diseases, we'll use lower pressure. But And then with more um, acute diseases or depending on what we're treating, for instance, carbon monoxide, we would have to use a much higher percentage and uh, much higher atmospheric pressure. But we do see some toxicities with high pressure in, in dogs and cats. And so I tend to be more conservative. So I try and probably would not go above 2.5 for very much. Does size of the animal matter? Some people think it does, but I don't, I don't believe it does because I've done um, little tiny critters and I've done, and people do horses. So it's and, and we use about the same pressures. So I don't think it does. Okay, so that's one of the areas where size doesn't matter. Because yeah, yeah. I get this question too. Okay, what if I have a really big dog or like well, I have a small dog, would she get um, oxygen toxicity because she's too small? Nope, same metabolism of the oxygen. How do animals feel? I know it's hard to judge because they can't talk. Unfortunately, they can't talk. But when, how would you observe, when you observe them, do you think they feel comfortable in Inside the chamber or so some dogs are very anxious because they're anxious dogs in general but most dogs just like it there they go in they fall asleep um, they relax again if they're very anxious we might give them something to help them relax a little bit before they go in the chamber but for the most part they seem to be very comfortable and another thing is you know people we get our ears um, we it's hard for us to clear our ears sometimes because our eustachian tubes are very um, flexible and soft, whereas most dogs and cats have very have much more firm eustachian tubes, and they don't typically have trouble clearing or um, or equalizing to the pressure. So that's kind of nice too. They do yawn and they do um, show us swallowing, but they tend to not show any discomfort whatsoever. Do you tend to go slower on uh, pressurizing and depressurizing times? Um, Just to make sure that we're doing everything as safe as possible, I take everyone up to pressure over fifteen minutes and they're mm -hmm. watched every second. We watch them constantly. We never leave any animal unobserved. Um, and so we take them up to pressure over 15 minutes and hope that, you know, usually it's perfectly fine. They settle there. We keep them at that pressure typically for about an hour. And then we bring them back down over 15 minutes again. Can they have seizures inside the chamber? They can. Any dog that's predisposed to seizures is more likely to have a seizure. So we 
we tend to not recommend hyperbarics for them unless we absolutely need to, then we would pre-medicate them with something. But um, one of the toxic symptoms is seizures. Fortunately, they tend to be very short-lived and self-limiting, so we don't have to stop anything. But once we do see a seizure, we will abort the procedure, but gently and slowly take them back down to pressure, to normal pressure. So they're, they're in the chamber by themselves. Is there a practice for an owner to go inside the chamber with their uh, pet? So in a veterinary hospital where we're using pressure above 1.3 or 1.4, we would not allow a person to go in there. It's just, it's not legal for us to treat yeah. a person yeah. and it's not responsible of us. So we would never do that. In fact, I wouldn't even let an employee or anybody go in the chamber. It's just not okay. But I'm pretty much a big stickler for rules. <laughs> Breaking them sometimes, but also keeping them. But yeah. when it comes yeah. to safety, that's the number one thing. You know, hyperbaric oxygen is not benign. It is a drug. It is delivering oxygen as a drug and it needs to be respected also as far as safety. But in the soft chambers, in the 1.3 um, atmosphere chambers, absolutely take your animal in with you all the time. They love it. <laughs> that was my next question. What do you think about uh, wellness treatments for pets? Because I understand that 1.3, probably not enough to treat an illness in an animal, right? You know, I don't think we really know that completely. I don't think it would hurt. And I know that um, we have a mutual friend, Bob the cat, and Bob the cat had a horrible stroke. And I think we attribute a lot of his success to coming back to full health by going in the chamber with his family. And he likes it so much. He lets himself in the chamber all the time now. And um, I do believe that probably helped Bob with his recovery somewhat. So I think it does have its effect. It's sort of, I think it's close to 17 feet of water as opposed to 33 feet of water. So I think it absolutely does something, but I don't know if it does enough or maybe just take would take longer perhaps. I see, so because when people come to the clinic, they've already traveled to the clinic, they're paying for the treatment, they're taking uh, time to do it, so you would do a higher pressure to make sure. In the clinic, we only have the high pressure chamber. I happen to have a soft pressure chamber at home for myself, for wellness. Do you have pets? I do, I do. Um, they're all very curious about it, but they're too big to come in with oh, me. Oh, I see. What are they, dogs? Dogs. Yeah, large dog, big dog? Big enough. <laughs> I see. Mine comes with me. I told you the story. She has an autoimmune condition. And especially initially at the beginning of the treatment, uh, hyperbarics really changed the course of her disease. And her uh, veterinarian, her neurologist, he's never heard about it. And he was pleasantly surprised and he wanted to research it further because he saw such an improvement that at one point he even started to question the diagnosis. So yeah, we, we have our, like Dr. Dornfield has uh, his story with Bob the cat, how he recovered well from stroke. How old was the cat? 18 or 19? Well, I was 18, yeah. 18. I think I saw pictures of him on his 19th birthday and he's oh, looking wow. great. Yeah, so he's a miracle good. kitty. And, and actually, I think that is one of the great things because for neurologic issues, hyperbaric oxygen, we typically do use lower pressures. So, and I know in, in human studies that they're using somewhat lower pressures. So I definitely think it's helpful. And some of the most remarkable recoveries are neurologic disease with hyperbaric oxygen. Besides stroke, spinal cord disease, and chronic inflammatory CNS issues like your dog. And animals can get concussions too, right? Yes. They can. So head trauma, we've absolutely used it for head trauma. We've used it for near death experiences or post resuscitation in, in stable animals. So yeah, lots of lots of uses. Another set of animals I wanted to talk about, uh, animals who help firefighters, they have a special name probably, but they're being exposed to a lot of carbon dioxide and all other chemicals that come from smoke. Have you treated Yes, we treat quite a number of smoke inhalation. Um, not only do they have cyanide poisoning and carbon monoxide poisoning from fire, but they also have burns inside their airways. And so if we can decrease that edema, that fluid that's building up in the lung from that in severe inflammatory process, we help them a great deal. So the firemen in our area know that we're there and they do bring us burn victims. And that's a, that's a real privilege to be able to help them. Yeah, they're special dogs. I love dogs in general, but these are really A lot special. of times it's cats too. It's cats the too? cats, they used to be a white cat, but when they come in after a fire, you can't recognize the cat. They look, they look like the natural gray or black cat because they're covered in soot. But uh, once they recover and we can clean them up, they uh, they clean up very nicely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they return to their original color. What about cancer? Because I know there is the incidence of cancer among animals has risen. 
uh, the same way as among humans, but more and more animals are being diagnosed, especially dogs are being diagnosed with cancer. Have you treated? Um... So I would not recommend it as a treatment for cancer. I don't know if it would prolong the life of a cancer patient, but I know that it doesn't interfere with some cancers and may have actually helped the survival of some animals because we do treat animals that have chemotherapy that gets outside of their vein. And when it gets outside of the vein, it can be extremely toxic and it can destroy the limb. And it used to be amputation was the only treatment for that. And I have treated dogs with lymphoma or lymphosarcoma that have had that problem and they have healed from the, um, the vein problem, but also they've lived quite a long time with their cancer as well. So I don't think it made anybody any worse and perhaps maybe helped a little bit with longevity, but I would never want to tell anybody that it's a treatment for cancer. I understand just to be on a cautious um, side of it, but uh, in your experience, it doesn't hurt. From what from the tr cancers I've treated, I do not think it has hurt at all. Do you also see that there are more and more animals are being diagnosed with cancer or? I think I've been doing this for treating animals for over 30 years. And uh, I think the incidence is probably the same. It's just never easier. You know, it's just always devastating. It is devastating in humans, but also devastating in animals. because, yeah. they, And it's usually being diagnosed, unless it's diagnosed accidentally, I think it's usually being diagnosed when they're in their terminal stages, right? That's right. Yeah, a lot of times they're good at hiding their diseases. You know, they're mm -hmm. very stoic. So sometimes we just don't find out until it's too late. But hopefully with an astute clinician or astute owner, we can find cancers more easily more and sooner. And there's a lot, a, lot of, a lot of new testing that's coming out. So even blood tests now in veterinary medicine to detect cancers. And maybe that could even become a routine screening and maybe we would be able to identify a lot of cancers a lot earlier. And that would be amazing. That would be amazing. I wanna, it, it, this question is a little bit outside of um, hyperbaric talk, but you said that animals tend to hide their diseases. And, yeah. and, and I believe that, why is that? Do you know why? I think it's hide? a survival mode, you know, fight, um, survival of the fittest. If, a, if an animal knows that another animal is weak and can't keep up, they're gonna be the prey. You know, they're gonna be the victim. So I think that evolutionarily dogs and cats have learned become very stoic and hide their hide their illnesses. Is there anything we can do about it as pet owners? I think good, I think taking them to the veterinarian every year for an examination is extremely important. Um, you know, recognizing when anything's different, don't be afraid to ask. There's no stupid questions when it comes to the health of your child, your pet, anybody, you know, if your veterinarian is uh, doesn't believe you, find a new one because owners know their pets better than anybody. And when people tell me something's wrong, I listen to them and I look into it. And so that's how we detect things earlier. I see you've been doing doing hyperbarics uh, for animals for 17 years. Yeah, that's hard to believe. You're, I didn't think I was that old. I'm only 27. How'd that happen? <laughs> you're a veteran. <laughs> hyperbarics, Phil, because there's not too many hyperbaric practitioners who've been doing that for that long. It doesn't matter if it's been done for human beings or for animals. Yeah, it, it's it, a privilege. It, it's uh, every time we put an animal in the chamber, we're in, we're in awe. We're, we say to ourselves every time, why are we so surprised? Why are we so in awe? But every single time we're just delighted with the outcome. It's just, it's a godsend. It really is. I wish more people would, would believe me and take it up. You know, a lot of neurologists are skeptical about it, but the more they see, the more they, they, they do it. But among patients or owners of your patients, should I say animal owners, yeah. there's, there's a lot of interest. There's Absolutely. A, a lot of interest. People want to know more about it. They want to know, okay, who is doing hyperbarics? Because again, there are not a lot of hyperbaric practitioners out there and even fewer in the field of veterinary medicine. Not, not that many. It's, it's some may be doing some hyperbarics for traumas, but not as extensively and for such an area of illnesses as you do. Do you teach hyperbarics? As a, as a course or as a... Yeah. I teach it a lot, you know, believe it or not, um, the MDs are much more willing and interested in learning about it than veterinarians because it's not as realistic for veterinarians. You know, they can't just go out and have a chamber. It's not as, it's not as easily accessible for them. So they don't pay as much attention to what it can do. And I, I wish that I could educate more and more, but yes, I've lectured to veterinarians and I've lectured to MDs and it just doesn't seem like I could ever say enough. So thank you for doing this podcast and hopefully more people will call and ask more about it. And um, one of the things I find is that a lot of times the owners ask the veterinarian for it 
as opposed to the veterinarian recommending it. So the more we can educate pet owners, the better off that pets will be. Yeah, and the more they would educate their uh, vets, I think. Yes. Like what happened to um, my dog's neurologist. He exactly. became really interested, you know, he started to do some research and he's actually at the teaching hospital and that teaching hospital belongs to the university that has a hyperbaric course. It's a oh, coincidence wonderful. and it's just, it's probably the only or one of the two universities in Spain that offer hyperbarics. So, you know, he has all the cards in his hands. Oh, to that's wonderful. That school offers it? It's the uh, university the Alfonso Puchado. It's one of the universities near Madrid and they offer hyperbaric course for um, medical doctors. Medical doctors, right. Yeah, but and they're also doing studies and we're being part of one of the studies. I can't say anything yet, but it's quite exciting. Um, and it is, it's, it's actually exciting that things are being done in Europe as well because the United States has always been leading sort of the research and you guys have more practitioners and maybe more interest and more among the public, but we're catching up uh -huh. slowly, but surely. And, and hopefully in the field of veterinary medicine as well. I think once you've seen it change the course of an illness in your own pet, you'll be convinced. I don't think that I've disappointed anybody. And that's a big statement. I mean, maybe we haven't gotten as far as we would like, but again, it's setting um, good expectations for people as well. It's as many miracles as it can perform. There's a lot of things it cannot do. And so we have to really be very honest with everybody and stay above board and, and have realistic expectations of what outcomes to expect. And but, are there contraindications to hyperbarics? Yeah, and... there's always some contraindications. Um, previous chest trauma would be the number one complication. Lung trauma or fluid or air in the chest would be a reason to, be, uh, to avoid it um, because we would cause problems breathing. High blood pressure, we know that dogs or cats with high blood pressure are more likely to have a seizure in the chamber. We know that um, we don't want certain um, things on their body that would go inside the chamber that would be metallic or any um, anything like that. But for the most part, there's it's pretty darn safe. As long as it's done properly, it's pretty safe. And when you said that you have to manage expectations, what do you mean by that? What it cannot I mean that, do? You know, we're not going to pull a Michael Jackson and think they're going to live forever. Mm. You know, we're not going to tell people that it can do things that it cannot do. And we're always going to say, this is what we're trying. And here's what our, ex here's what we hope to achieve. Here's what we've achieved in the past, but I don't want you to expect, you know, your dog to be walking tomorrow necessarily or in three days, you know, just really keeping, being honest and, and using our experience and and keeping a good reputation for the good practice of veterinary medicine in general and also hyperbarics because we want people to accept it and we want it to grow and we don't want it to be a bunch of hype, you know? Uh, yeah. It's not a gimmick, you know? It's a real thing and it has real capabilities and some things it cannot do. It's not a magic pill. Correct. I think it's not, but it's a great tool. It really is. And that's another important point. It's to be used in conjunction with other therapies. So very rarely is it the only treatment that we would institute while we're treating a patient. And so sometimes that requires a team of people as well, right? We're not just going to put a difficult healing wound in there. We're also going to address the wound with medications and with dressings and other things. So it's an adjunctive therapy for the most part. And like with human medicine as well, it's always, unless it's a very, very specific indication of carbon monoxide poisoning. Correct. Yeah, we'll put them under right. high pressure and hopefully a patient gets better. But if it's something, especially off-label, maybe neurological disease, we're using different therapies. And that's the beauty of it because right. we have this toolbox and different tools that work really well together. And that's how we're able to achieve best results for the patient, whether it's a human patient or an animal patient. Right. Uh, Multimodal therapy, we call it. <laughs> I've heard that also, I, because I said human patient and animal patient, and you know what I saw? Because they're, they also put putting plants inside the hyperbaric chamber. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, they're doing a lot of studies uh, here in Spain about the plants and germination and uh, um, to make sure that they get crops instead of getting it twice a year, they get it like four times a year um, wow. because they're growing things inside the hyperbaric chamber. I was absolutely amazed when I heard that. So it's oh, not I've just- I've got to look that one up. <laughs> it's not just human patient, anyway, it's also plant 
a patient, not, not so much a patient, but isn't that amazing? Uh, it really is. You know, one of my favorite slides to show is, you know, it's very hard sometimes to believe because it's not always tangible. But if you could see a before and after of just a horrible allergic reaction, you can't deny the effectiveness of it because you can literally see it. So many times it is a tangible treatment um, and that's that's very rewarding too. Absolutely. That's why we do what we do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to get that. It, it, it's an amazing reward of seeing patients get better. It that's, really is. Yeah. Like I always say, it's a gift. <laughs> it's a gift. Yeah, it's an honor and it's a gift. And if people want to find you, where can they find you? Well, right now I'm a professor at Long Island University and so you can always find me there or um, you have my email, which are perfectly welcome to put up dlevitan at overback.com. Um, feel free to reach out to me anytime. It would be my pleasure. Thank you. And where are you located? Maybe I'm in Long Island, New York. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, New York. Um, people have come from all over many states to see us and to use the chamber. They stay in local places or they leave their pet with us for a period of time. And um, we're always willing to be there for whoever needs us. So Long Island, New York. Thank you for coming to the show and sharing your experience with hyperbarics and veterinary medicine. Thank you for giving us all this useful information, what it can be used for, how to use it, who shouldn't be using it, and also that you can do it for wellness for animals as well. So guys, if you have a hyperbaric chamber at home and you have a pet, take them in. Take them in. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope to see you live, not just, yes. you know, Zoom thing, but uh, one of the conferences conferences hopefully I we'll hope get so. to see, yeah get to see each other and please Thank you, don't hesitate to reach out to me whoever is interested because it's yeah, my absolutely. passion and I, I love to share it thank you thank you I really appreciate it all righty